Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is 10 to Life where we are talking all things true crime. So if you are brand new and stopping by for the first time, welcome and I hope you enjoy today's case video. And for all of my returning 10 to Lifers, welcome back. I am so happy to have you guys here with me today and so happy to have you guys as loyal 10 to Lifers. The case we are talking about today is one that is probably going to be a little bit on the longer side, so I just want to give you guys a warning because there is a lot of information in this case, and it's one that is, you know, just very, very unsettling and hard to wrap your mind around. And as we go through it, you, of course, will understand why. And this case has actually also been highly requested by many of you, but it is going to lean on the longer side. So I just want to give you guys a heads up there. For most children, Easter is a joyful and fun day every year. The Easter Bunny usually pays a visit and leaves a basket of goodies. There's decorating eggs, doing Easter egg hunts, and really just spending time with family usually. Some families also go to church. Some spend all day preparing an Easter ham. And regardless, when you think of Easter, you usually think of a happy day in the spring. Unfortunately for one Georgia family, this past Easter would be one of the worst days of their lives. Instead of their house being filled with laughter and fun, it was filled with flames and death and secrets. Local authorities have referred to this family as the House of Horrors, as this case has been developing. And we are finding out more and more disturbing details every single day. So guys, let's get right into it. On April 17th, 2022, in the early hours of Easter morning, a call was made to 911 from an occupant living inside a home located in Loganville, Georgia. Loganville is a city located in Gwinnett County, I hope I'm saying that right, which is about 30 miles from Atlanta. And the call came in at about 4.47 a.m. about a house fire located off a rural dirt road. The caller was Mother Karina McHugh, also known as Karame, who told dispatch that two children were outside and she was still trying to reach two more children inside the house. When help arrived, firefighters began working to get the fire hoses through the tree line and into this somewhat isolated home. They initiated a VES, or a vent enter search technique, which is when firefighters enter the home several but short amounts of time, looking in obvious places that aren't yet fully engulfed in flames to find survivors quickly before beginning more extensive search and rescue tactics and going in deeper. The firefighters primarily utilize the windows on the exterior of the home to search for the two remaining children. Tragically, once the fire was contained, the body of 10-year-old Zoe McHugh was found trapped inside a windowless bathroom in the interior of the home. Karina called her husband, William, who was working at the Waffle House, to let him know what had happened. Another one of their children, who was 17 years old, was also at work, and two children were safe in the yard out front. However, one other child, 15-year-old Nathaniel McHugh, was unaccounted for still. Firefighters and other emergency personnel conducted multiple aggressive searches in order to find him, but he was nowhere to be found. And due to Zoe's perishing in the fire, it was assumed that Nathaniel must have died as well in that fire and was maybe somewhere buried inside the rubble of the home. The search continued for hours into the morning until around 9 a.m. when a call was made letting officers know that a distressed child was located at a nearby church. And that child was in fact Nathaniel, who was described as acting so bizarrely that the deputies on the scene had to use crisis intervention strategies to communicate with him. After learning that he had run away from home, shockly, after learning that he had run away from home, shockingly, Nathaniel confessed to the deputies that he is the one who set the home on fire and that it was on purpose and that he was aware that his family was asleep inside. Nathaniel was arrested for arson, with many more charges to come. What would make a 15-year-old boy, who is described as being very timid, light his family's home on fire? Now, nothing can excuse what he did, but evidence found during the investigation of the McHugh home and into this family may help us understand the mindset of Nathaniel and perhaps 
what sort of things were happening to him and his sibling that may have caused him to snap. Nathaniel was immediately arrested following his confession to starting the fire. He is being held in a youth detention center, and due to his age, his mugshot has not yet been released. However, he is being charged as an adult. His charges include malice murder, capital felony murder, and first-degree arson. But what about the other siblings? This case is already very, very unsettling, but the things discovered in the McHugh home really remind me a lot of the Turpin case out of California, which is also referred to commonly as the House of Horrors, if that tells you anything. During the arson investigation, authorities uncovered several things that shed light as to what was going on inside that home. Even though the house is said to have been completely unlivable and a total loss, enough of it was left intact to see that the doors all had locks on them from the outside, indicating that the children were locked inside of these rooms. It was also discovered that there was no working plumbing in the house, no toilets, no working showers. The windowless room where Zoe was found was actually an interior bathroom, and inside the non-functional bathtub was a makeshift bed, and Zoe was found lying inside of it. Now, I'm really hoping that Zoe died of smoke inhalation while she was asleep and didn't have to suffer too much from the fire. However, if Zoe was sleeping inside a normal bedroom with windows, in my opinion, she would have been saved by those firefighters because they would have gone to those rooms first to look. In fact, she probably would have also gotten out safely with her siblings. Why did Karame, Zoe's mom, not tell the firefighters where she was located and that her bedroom was essentially inside a bathroom? If she was locked inside the bathroom, surely she would have known that. She could have directed them right towards Zoe. All of the other doors were locked as well, so she must have only had enough time to unlock a few of them and then ran out of time before she could unlock the door that was trapping Zoe inside. In the kitchen, the sink had a tube going into a five-gallon bucket on the floor. Other buckets in the home show that the family had been using these buckets as toilets. And in another bathtub was a piece of wood balanced on top of it to make another makeshift bed. After the fire, the family was taken to the hospital to be evaluated. During the exam of the children, much more disturbing evidence was found and showed serious signs of abuse and neglect. Evidence was presented in court during a custody hearing by a caseworker for the Department of Family and Children's Services. She said that the children had appeared to have not been bathed in weeks and possibly even months. With the exception of the oldest, 17-year-old child, the children were also severely malnourished, which coincided with the lack of food found in the home. There was also a human bite mark found healing on the inner thigh of one of the children, and even though he told the caseworker it was a dog bite, it was proven to be a human bite. It's not uncommon for children who suffer from abuse to be told to lie if asked about their injuries. On this child's other thigh were 10 whip marks. Now this child is only 8 years old. Another child, who was 12 years old, had multiple healing lacerations on his back and bruising on his arms, which he disclosed was from his mother whipping him with a belt. Documents prove that the children have not attended school in years, and in fact, had not even been outside the home in several years, with the exception of the oldest child going to work. The children had no medical records, and they had no shots or immunization records. They had no sort of documentation or medical history on record. They disclosed to the caseworker that they were locked in separate rooms and weren't even allowed to see each other for months at a time. According to investigators, the children didn't even know how to use a real toilet and had not been taught how to use toilet paper. The children were placed into protective custody, but shockingly, at this time, the judge granted visitation until the next court date that was set to take place a week later. There still was visitation in play here. Officers described the 15-year-old boy who set the house on fire as being very awkward, very shy, and very timid, frail, and walking with a very bizarre gait. His lawyer told the court that his initial conversation with police was the first adult he'd spoken to outside of the home in 10 years. 
And again, this reminds me a lot of the Turpin children, who noticeably had a very strange way of speaking due to being isolated from the outside world. Now, the gate may be from malnourishment, not being allowed to go outside for exercise that children of course need, or even physical abuse. The Turpins too were locked in rooms, didn't receive medical care, and were abused physically and mentally. And like members of the Turpins' extended family, the McHugh's family and the grandparents, the aunt, as well as neighbors, stated that they had no clue what was going on inside the home. The grandfather explained that he had not seen them in years because they locked them inside due to COVID. One of the biggest excuses and reasons we have seen out there for this escalation and surge in cases like these. People are unfortunately able to get away with a lot more because they lean on COVID. According to the neighbor living next door to the McHughes, he had only ever seen children in the yard one time in 15 years and that they ran away when they saw him. He said, and I quote, people around here kind of knew that something wasn't right. They never left the house. If they did, they left early in the dark and returned at night in the dark. From my knowledge, they were homeschooled. Other people stated that they never see family at the store, at the gas station, and that many people had concerns about the parents, which I can't help but wonder if that many people were concerned or worried why I had nobody drawn attention to it or made a call to make sure that everything was okay. The following custody hearing was set to take place on May 9th, 2022, but when William and Karame caught wind that they might be facing possible charges, they split and they left town. Police are still searching for the couple who were last seen at a local hotel and then left driving a white 2017 Honda Accord. They have now been charged with first and second degree cruelty to children and false imprisonment. In Georgia, a first-degree cruelty to children charge means that a parent or a guardian willingly deprives a child under 18 with necessary sustenance to the extent that a child's well-being is jeopardized. Second degree is when a person with criminal negligence causes a child under 18 cruel or excessive physical or mental pain. Both of these felony charges can lead to a prison term between 1 to 10 years. And I'm assuming that neglect falls under one of those charges because under the Georgia Maltreatment Code guidelines, it states that the shelter or residence provided by a caregiver for a child must not be unsafe or unsanitary. And it even gives the example of exposure to raw sewage, which we know the children were exposed to. Under the negligence guidelines, it also states that parents cannot withhold food and must provide essential medical and dental care for a child. Educational and cognitive neglect would be when a parent fails to provide proper education, and obviously these children did not go to school and were not receiving any type of homeschooling either. The things that these children have gone through is just so unsettling and horrible. I can't imagine the amount of therapy and rehabilitation it's going to take for them to get on track to a normal and happy childhood. And thankfully, the children are now placed with a safe foster family. And I really do, I say that with a grain of salt because I really hope that this foster family will provide the love and care for these children that they deserve because we saw with the Turpin children that not all foster homes are loving and nurturing and have good foster parents because the Turpin children experienced even more abuse and kind of in some cases, worse abuse in their foster homes that they were then sent to, and they were just failed miserably by the system, which I will link the videos to all of the Turpin coverage also below in case you are interested in learning more about that case or seeing the update that just came out last month of these new foster parents being charged. However, I do hope that all of these children can move forward, but one of the children who will not be getting that opportunity is the 15-year-old, 15-year-old Nathaniel. Now, I'm, again, not excusing his behavior by any means, but think of the abuse that this boy experienced throughout his life. I think it's going to be very important for the court to consider where he was at mentally when he decided to light this home on fire. Maybe he did it as a way to escape the home. Maybe he did it hoping that it would set all of the kids free and that they wouldn't have to be locked in this house anymore that by lighting the fire, the firefighters would come, everybody would come out of the house and they could disclose what had been going on inside of the house. Or maybe he just had experienced so much psychological abuse in his short life that he snapped and made a very rash decision. 
he now is going to be charged with capital murder due to Zoe being under the age of 10, which in Georgia is a mandatory life sentence with or without parole, or even the death penalty. Obviously, I don't think that they can give a 15-year-old the death penalty, but the law states that capital punishment may apply to defendants 17 years and older, so it is interesting because he is being charged as an adult. The mother of William McHugh was interviewed following him and his wife fleeing, and this is what she had to say. At county parents accused of abusing their kids and refusing to allow them to leave their home for years. They're still on the run tonight after failing to show up for court today. The family's grandmother is only speaking with Tracy A. McPeer about the allegations and the search for her son, Tracy. Well, right now the state is seeking to keep the children in foster care. And I spoke with the grandmother who has this message for the parents. Come home now. We have no clue where they went. Mary McHugh says she hasn't been in contact with her son, William McHugh, and his wife, Karina, since last week, and was as surprised as police to learn they had allegedly skipped town. Even if he called us and that stuff, we do have to report it. Mm -hmm. So that may be why he's not calling us. Warrants accuse the parents of not allowing their children to leave the property their entire lives, preventing the children from receiving education and depriving the victims of basic medical care and basic nutrition and hygiene for years. McHugh says she was unaware of any concerns about the kids' well-being. No, I wouldn't have known any of these things. I saw their kitchen and it was spotless. The abuse and neglect allegations only came to light after the McHugh's 10-year-old daughter, Zoe, was killed when their home caught fire on Easter. Their 15-year-old son is charged with murder, accused of intentionally setting the fire. The court hearing today was to determine whether the parents' three other children should remain in foster care moving forward. But because the parents didn't show up, the hearing was rescheduled for July. Mary McHugh says she's hoping her son turns himself in soon. If it's not true, why run? They got scared. Yeah, I'd be very With scared. all that stuff being said, yeah, they're scared. So they need to come and set the record straight. Yeah, okay, I'm sure that the children were scared too, Grandma. I'm sure they were scared about being locked in rooms alone and scared that they wouldn't get to eat or that they would be hit or whipped by a belt if they did try to eat. I'm sorry, but I just find that to be completely unacceptable. The grandparents lived less than two miles away and somehow didn't know that anything was wrong. The kitchen was spotless. Did you not notice that there was a tube coming in from the kitchen sink and into a toilet bucket? Did you not know there were multiple toilet buckets? Did you not smell everything and the odor inside of that? How could they have not known that children were being locked in that house day and night? This, in my opinion, has been going on far longer than COVID, so that is not an excuse. How are the grandparents so unaware that the children didn't go to the doctor, that they don't go to school, that they don't know how to use a toilet or toilet paper? How do they not see that they are severely malnourished and are not bathing? I mean, I realize that not all grandparents are involved in their grandchildren's lives, but these grandparents lived 1.8 miles away. You can walk that distance in literally 30 minutes. There is no way that even if they weren't involved, that they weren't aware that the fact that the children have never been to school and that they weren't allowed to go outside, there's just no way, and I'm not buying this at all. So many people have failed these children. If you're a neighbor and you are aware of a child living in a home and you never see them for years, maybe it's a good idea to mention it to someone, mention that there may be a problem, or if you're brave enough, go knock on the door yourself as a friendly neighbor and say hello. And if you're a grandparent, you have a responsibility to do something about your grandchildren being neglected and physically hurt this way. Here are some of the things that William's father, the children's grandfather, had to say. In the court documents we got inside that hearing, DFAX claims it believes the other three children are in danger. It claims they hadn't been to school in years and they hadn't showered for months. And the allegations don't stop there. I haven't seen her for a long time because they locked themselves in the house because of the coronavirus. Oh, really? Yeah, he'd stayed in forever. William McHugh IV lives less than two miles away from his son's family in Loganville, where a fire early Sunday morning killed his 10-year-old granddaughter, Zoe. Yeah, she's a cute little girl. Tell me about she's her. She's beautiful. She had blonde hair and blue eyes and 
She was sweet. Her 15-year-old brother is now charged with felony murder and malice murder for allegedly setting the fire that caused her death. It's hard to believe. I can't even believe it, really, until I see it. I don't know about you guys, but I just feel like the grandparents knew more than they are saying. I don't think that they necessarily condoned it or contributed to what was going on, but I do think that they turned a blind eye at the expense of their grandchildren. And maybe it's because they inflicted the same type of living situation on their kids when they were younger. I don't know. But the grandfather saying that William was locked up there due to COVID doesn't seem to make much sense considering William was at work the day of the fire along with his oldest daughter. So if you haven't seen your son in years and you don't know the well-being of your grandchildren, why wouldn't you roll on up to the Waffle House to see him in person and check how things are going? So now we have two cases, and I don't know about you, but I'm left with even more questions than answers. First of all, we need to know where these parents are. Here are the statements made by the parents about the fire. Her favorite cartoon was Frozen. Her favorite color was pink. She liked the little princesses. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. Karina McHugh broke down in tears thinking about her 10-year-old daughter Zoe, who died when the family home went up in flames Easter morning. Zoe's mother and two of the children made it out safely. Police say Zoe's 15-year-old brother intentionally started the fire at their Loganville home. I love my son and, you know, I don't understand this. On top of the loss of their home and their daughter, the McHughes are now facing charges of neglect and abuse. Defax says their five children don't go to school and haven't left the house in years. McHugh says they're homeschooled and kept them home often during COVID. He mainly stated um, out of public eye because of coronavirus. He says there are some problems, like the house didn't have plumbing, but he was working on it. McHugh says since the fire, he's been overwhelmed by the people in the community who have expressed kindness and offered to help. We've always been the type of people to try to do, you know, to make it on our own without, you know, okay. taking advantage of other people. And maybe that we should have asked for help a long time ago in certain things, and so maybe that's my biggest downfall. I don't know what's going to be come up in the future, but, it, you know, we're going to tackle those issues. I, I think one at a time. Well, William, parents who are wanting to show that they are trying to be the best that they can be for their children don't just skip town when they are facing charges. And I can see keeping your family at home due to COVID, but that doesn't explain why they were locked in their rooms from the outside and not allowed to play outside in the yard. You can't get COVID from just being in your own front yard. If the allegations aren't true, why not fight with everything you have to prove them to be false so that you can get your children back? I don't know of any good loving parent who wouldn't be absolutely ripped apart if their children were placed in foster care and had to be away from them like that. And let's talk about little Zoe. Wouldn't you be wanting to plan the memorial, the service, be involved, make sure that your children are okay and grieving properly, not fleeing town? It just shows, in my opinion, a sense of guilt and selfishness, honestly. He definitely doesn't sound like somebody who just lost a daughter. I would expect that kind of demeanor from a father whose son just lit the house on fire, seeming angry or maybe kind of stressed or worried. But you'd think he would be a little more emotional considering his 10-year-old daughter was in that house. William said that maybe he should have asked for help a long time ago in terms of the condition of the home. But that doesn't address the children being locked in rooms for weeks and months at a time. It doesn't explain separating the siblings, physically hurting them, and not providing them with enough food. That is not a result of the house and the conditions. It is the living arrangement that you are providing for them. It doesn't also explain why he wouldn't have called a plumber to fix the toilets or why his children didn't even know how to use toilet paper. And just like the case I covered a few months ago about the parents in Jupiter, Florida, Tracy and Timothy Ferreter, it is a never okay to keep children locked up anywhere. It is not okay to seclude and confine children to the point that they are forced to defecate in buckets, which we saw in all of these cases. Next, I would like to know how this was even able to happen. 
there needs to be some sort of system in place so that children aren't able to just completely fly under the radar and never see the light of day again. I mean, I'm assuming that William and Karame filed taxes. I would assume also that they received some sort of state benefits or government assistance for that many children, considering the wage at the Waffle House for employees is between $12.50 and $15 an hour in Georgia. So there needs to be a way where these children who are claimed as dependents are actually enrolled in school or a state accredited homeschooling program or some way that can track if children are even alive. I know most good parents wouldn't appreciate the state being involved with us or our children, but just some sort of form of documentation and proof each year that the child is alive and well and hitting all of their medical markers so that people can't just have secret kids trapped inside their home. Maybe something like when a child is born and given their social security number, it can be attached to a nationwide medical records database and can flag kids who have never seen a doctor. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is but more has to be done to ensure the safety and well-being of children. One other question I have is about the 17-year-old daughter. Obviously, she has probably been through a lifetime of abuse herself as well, but I'm wondering if there was ever an opportunity for her to mention to anyone what was going on with her siblings, about being locked up, about not being fed properly, or if anybody ever noticed anything unusual about her herself. Was she threatened, perhaps, to not say anything? This entire situation is extremely tragic. It's tragic that a 15-year-old boy felt that he had or wanted to light his family's home on fire and now is facing all of these charges. And any way that this trial goes, his life is completely ruined. It's tragic the way that this family was living, the abuse, the neglect, and everything that the children experienced. But the most tragic thing of all is the death of beautiful 10-year-old little Zoe. In Zoe's obituary, it was said that she enjoyed playing with Legos, playing outside, even though nobody saw her playing outside, swimming, coloring, and drawing, and that her family called her Ladybug and their little princess. Even though her parents didn't treat her like a princess, I do hope she really was able to experience some of these things and at least have some sort of happy memories that she can carry with her from her short life. So that's where we are right now with these two cases in one. We have Nathaniel's murder charges and the parents' charges as well as they are fleeing. And the parents need to stop being cowards and turn themselves in so that they can either try to defend themselves or just admit to what they did to their children and how the situation was able to come to this. Because by them not doing either of those things, there is no justice for Zoe, no justice or accountability for Nathaniel. It's just empty. And I also wonder if since Zoe was locked in a room purposefully, would the parents be held accountable in some way for her not being able to get out of the home on her own? So would they be held accountable for her murder? If she wasn't kept in a locked windowless bathroom, it's likely that she could have escaped or have been saved by the firefighters. As horrible as what Nathaniel did was, I really do feel like something contributed mentally to his choices that he made that day. The way that the officers described him and his demeanor, and when you consider the abuse that he has gone through, there has to be something more there. I'll be interested to see what the defense brings to trial. As for now, at least the children, including Nathaniel, are out of these horrible conditions that they were kept in. And I'm sure that once the parents are found, justice will be served for all of the children that they have just so horribly and massively failed. I will definitely be keeping you updated on this case, and police have asked that if anybody has any information on the whereabouts of William and Karina McHugh to please call the county police at 770-577-8477. Again, they were last seen in a 2017 white Honda Accord with the license plate number C as in Charlie, H as in Harry, B as in boy, 7385. There is also a cash reward given to anyone with a tip that leads to the arrest of the McHughes, and tips can also be left at StopCrimeATL.com. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below, and what do you believe Nathaniel should be held accountable for? Should he have life in prison? Should he have the death penalty? Should they put him into a facility and get him treatment? 
something just doesn't feel right about this because I don't know if his actions were truly sinister. And that's something that we're still waiting to learn and waiting to hear from. So I'll keep you updated. Thanks for tuning in with me today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the case coverage. And until the next case, stay safe. Bye.